Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna take a look at bilirubin metabolism and have a look and see what happens when this bilirubin begins to accumulate too high in the blood, resulting in a yellow discoloration of our skin, our conjunctiva, but also of our mucous membranes that we call jaundice. To begin with, we need to focus on bilirubin and what it actually is. Bilirubin is a degradation product of hemoglobin, basically. So what you'll find is our red blood cells are packed full of hemoglobin. Red blood cells don't even have a nucleus, so it can make room for all that hemoglobin. Why? Because hemoglobin carries oxygen, super important. And again, 70 to 90% of the bilirubin that our body produces comes from hemoglobin. The rest come from other heme proteins like myoglobin, which is the muscle equivalent of hemoglobin. So we've got our red blood cell. It's packed full of hemoglobin. So let's pop a hemoglobin in here. Hb is how we write our hemoglobin. After around about 120 days, something happens to our red blood cells. Just like us, as we get older, they become misshapen. And when they become misshapen, it makes it more difficult for them to move through some narrow blood vessels and capillaries, which isn't good, right? It means it's gonna make it more difficult to deliver oxygen to the tissues of the body. So when it goes through very specific blood vessels that we call reticuloendothelial systems, let's write that down, reticulo, reticuloendothelial systems, these are blood vessels found within the spleen, predominantly, the liver, and the bone marrow. And again, after around about 120 days, when our red blood cells are misshapen and they move through these reticular endothelial systems, I've drawn the spleen up here, something happens. They get targeted for destruction by phagocytes. These are cells that eat things up, like macrophages. So as the, these red blood cells enter, after 120 days, the spleen, macrophages start to gobble them up. And they release all of that hemoglobin. Now obviously, hemoglobin is made up of two important things, heme and globin. That's not really surprising, is it? Now what happens is, the globin portion is made up of amino acids. So we just reutilize those amino acids elsewhere. That's simple. The heme portion, is what we need to metabolize. But we know that within heme, the crown jewel of heme is iron. And it's actually an iron ion, which sounds a bit confusing, but we know that an ion is a charged atom or element, and so Fe2 plus is the iron ion. That goes and gets reutilized elsewhere in the body. So now we need to metabolize that heme, and we turn that heme into something called biliverdin. And we do this through an enzyme called heme oxygenase. Heme oxygenase. So now we've got biliverdin. If we were a bird or a reptile or an amphibian, that would be fine. We could actually excrete biliverdin through our poo or our pee, but we're not a bird, a reptile or an amphibian. We are human beings, damn it. And what that means is we have babies within our womb and they require a placenta. And they require substances to cross the blood placental barrier. Biliverdin can't cross the blood placental barrier. Now this is important because obviously after 120 days in utero, the baby's red blood cells need to be broken down. And they're gonna accumulate biliverdin and the way they get rid of it is by giving it to mum through the blood placental barrier. It can't happen. So biliverdin accumulates. This isn't a good thing. We don't want biliverdin to accumulate because it's toxic. And you can get hyperbiliverdinemia. Hyper above biliverdin, biliverdinemia in the blood. Hyperbiliverdinemia, it's got a bit of a green color to biliverdin. So they get what's called green jaundice. Not something you want. Also, when we turn biliverdin, so here's another point here. Billy Verdon gets turned into Billy Rubin, right? Which is the focus of this lecture. Turns to Billy Rubin through an enzyme called Billy Verdon reductase. Billy Verdon reductase. It's rare, but there are mutations in the gene that encodes for Billy Verdon reductase. That means that this can't happen. So again, biliverdin accumulates and you can get bili, uh, hyperbiliverdinemia. Again, green jaundice. But now we've got bilirubin. And let's denote bilirubin 
with a B, just to make things easier so we don't have to write it every time. This Billy, Ver uh, Billy Rubin will jump into the systemic circulation, jump into the bloodstream. The thing is this, Billy Rubin doesn't really like water. It's hydrophobic. It loves lipids. It loves fats, which means it makes it really easy to cross blood-brain barriers, for example, cross through cells because they've got that fatty lipid layer around it, right? But it means it's not very good at swimming through the bloodstream. So it needs something to help it swim through the bloodstream. And that's going to be an important protein called albumin. So albumin is produced in the liver and it's a transport protein. So I like to think of it as the liver limo. It binds to bilirubin and allows for it to move through the bloodstream unimpeded. Here's the thing. This bilirubin that we have here is called unconjugated bilirubin. Unconjugated. And some students get confused because they think that once albumin's bound to it, it's now conjugated. It's not. This is still unconjugated bilirubin. Really important because you can obviously have conjugated and varying levels of conjugated versus unconjugated bilirubin in the blood, if they go too high, can give you an indication as to what is the cause of the jaundice, the yellowing due to the high levels of bilirubin. We'll get there. So now we've got bilirubin bound to albumin. It goes through the bloodstream and at some point it's going to get into the liver. Now once it's in the liver, the albumin buggers off and gets utilized elsewhere probably to bind to more bilirubin that's being made. How much bilirubin do we make per day? That's probably an interesting point. What you'll find is we make around about four milligrams per kilogram per day. Now I am a 70 kilogram male, and I'm sorry if you're using the metric system, but I'm in Australia here. So 70 kilograms times four milligrams is gonna be 280 milligrams per day of bilirubin I produce, all right? That's important. Now, normal levels in the blood, if I were to take your blood and measure bilirubin, it'd be around about 1.2 milligrams per deciliter. That's normal. If this begins to go too high, right? It goes too high, too high, too high. It, this bilirubin can be deposited into our skin, into our conjunctiva, so our sclera, into our mucous membranes, and we go yellow because bilirubin has a yellow color to it, right? This only becomes apparent, this manifestation of the discoloration, that's called jaundice, only becomes apparent when we hit around about three to four milligrams per deciliter. All right, that's an aside. I just thought that that was an interesting point to bring up. So once this has happened, I told you the albumin buggers off, it goes somewhere else. But that bilirubin now needs to be conjugated because remember, it's unconjugated and we now need to conjugate it. And in order to do so, we need an enzyme that has an absolutely ridiculously long name that you need to know, which is UDP glucuronosyl transferase. Whoa, all right. Glucuronosyl transferase. Oh. Horrible name. What does it do? It basically takes a glucuronic acid and clicks it onto the bilirubin. Why? Because glucuronic acid makes bilirubin water soluble now. Remember, it's not water soluble at this point. Albumin bound to it. It helped carry it. And now we need to make it more water soluble. So why do we want to make it water soluble? Well, it allows for us to excrete it better. Bilirubin is not something we want to keep in the body. It is toxic, particularly neurotoxic, we don't want it to get to the brain. So if we make it water soluble, it's less likely to go through cells because of that fatty layer, right? So it's less likely to cross the blood brain barrier and more likely to be peed out or pooed out, for example. That's the reason why. So we take this bilirubin and now we can click some glucuronic acid to it. So it's a G now instead of an A. And now what we have is conjugated Billy Rubin. Let's write it here. Conjugated Billy Rubin. So from here to here, unconjugated. From here to here, it's going to be conjugated. So this conjugated bilirubin gets thrown from the liver into the gallbladder. The gallbladder contains bile. So now we've got bilirubin 
conjugated to glucuronic acid, which we can just call conjugated bilirubin, mixed in with the bile. What does bile do when we eat fatty meals? A B, it's because I said bile, that's why. A G for glucuronic acid. It squirts this out when we have a fatty meal, for example, because what does bile do? It emulsifies fats. So that means it gets squirted into the intestines. And at some point, this conjugated bilirubin is gonna come across gut bacteria. The gut flora, what does this gut flora do? It likes to gobble it up and it metabolizes it even further. So we're gonna have this gut bacteria now, gobbling it up. And it metabolizes it further, turns it into something called urobilinogen. 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 This urobilinogen, if it remains in the bowel, turns to something called stercobilin. Stercobilin. And this is pooed out. It's pooed out. And in actual fact, it's the reason why our poo is brown this stercobilin, meaning bilirubin is the reason why our poo is brown, meaning recycling or killing off or metabolizing our red blood cells is the reason why your poo is brown. This is an important point, as we'll get to when we start to focus on jaundice, because if there's a problem with your red blood cell production or breakdown, your poo may change color. Keep that in mind. All right, so that's what happens. Now, in actual fact, about 85% of your bilirubin gets pooed out. So that's where most of it goes. That's the end point for most. But what we'll find is that this urobilinogen can actually get absorbed into the bloodstream. What does it do once it's in the bloodstream now? Well, a couple of things. It can either go to the kidneys, where it turns into urobilin, and again, this is at the kidneys. And what do you think our kidneys are gonna do with it? We're gonna pee it out. And this is around about 5% of our bilirubin that this happens to. Or it can go back to the liver. And if it goes back to the liver, we've got this cycle happening here, right? This circulation, what's called the enterohepatic circulation. Let's write it down. Enterohepatic circulation. Again, this is about 5% that this is happening to. So you can see at the end of the day what happens to your bilirubin. You produce around about 200, between 200 to 300 milligrams per day from our red blood cells being broken down. Bilirubin, it's unconjugated until it gets to the liver. Then it becomes conjugated, making it more water soluble. Jumps into the gallbladder, then the bowel, where either it can come out in our poo, come out via our kidneys in our pee, or go back into our liver and be recirculated again. That's around about 5%. Now that we've drawn this up, what we can do is that we can have a look at the causes of jaundice. Jaundice, again, is that yellow discoloration that occurs if you have elevated levels of bilirubin. If you have elevated levels of bilirubin, it is called hyperbilirubinemia. Remember, hyper means above, bilirubin is the metabolic product, and emia is referring to the blood. So let's now take a look at jaundice.